Welcome everyone to tonight's Immunisation Coalition's webinar event. Our topic this evening is COVID-19 disease in Australia. I'm Gary Groman and I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm an Immunisation Coalition board member and a member of the scientific committee. And I'm a consultant virologist and currently uh, consult independently to various groups, including the World Health Organisation, the Immunisation uh, Coalition, uh, and uh, other regulatory groups as well. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, participating in this webinar. I pay my respects for elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. Presenting tonight's session is Professor Robert Boy, who we all know well, I'm sure. He'll be speaking for around 40 minutes tonight, which should leave us uh, with enough time uh, for questions and comments uh, that you may have. Now, please uh, note, please type questions via the Q&A button, not the chat box. And I'll just repeat that. Please type questions in via the Q&A button and not the chat box at any time during the session you will find this at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's presentation will be recorded, so all participants will automatically be on mute for the event. So I'd just like to briefly introduce Rob, Robert. Um, Robert Boy is an infectious disease pediatrician. He's currently a senior professional fellow, uh, sorry, senior professorial fellow at the University of Sydney Children's Hospital Westmead clinical school. He leads the scientific advisory committee of the immunization Co coalition and is also a board member. You may recognize Robert from regular TV appearances on Australian television during the pandemic. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and welcome to you Robert. The floor is yours. Thank you Gary and uh, really lovely to be with everyone. Um, I'm sorry it's in Zoom and not in person but Soon we'll have in-person meetings as well, which would be just wonderful. My title slide gives me quite a lot to talk about, the COVID-19 variants, uh, antivirals, vaccines, and even co-infection at this time. And further issues, if we get time, uh, a few comments about vaccine hesitancy and what I call multidemics, the idea that not just COVID is uh, a problem, but flu and RSV and adenovirus and paraflu. There's a whole bunch of viruses that are coming to get us this winter. And I say that uh, not with my tongue in cheek, but uh, in, in facing reality. So um, uh, here, here goes, uh, I hope you can keep up with me. Uh, I actually, um, uh, if I have control of my slides, I need to go backwards. Um, and uh, that's not happening. So what have I got to do? If you just click on your slide, Robert, it's Susie from my oh, everyone. I click Hi. on the slide. And then you can Donna. use your left and right buttons either down uh, or down. Okay, there. you Thank you. solved my problem. So I'm just going to open up. Uh, this is where I'm coming from tonight. It's a place called Kirribilli, North Sydney. Um, and it's one of the most densely populated parts of Australia. And yet you can see all those trees. So we don't have anything like the crowding in Australia that you do in Asia or Africa. And why is that important? Well, infectious diseases just love, since humans started coming out of the trees and going in to um, uh, growing food for themselves and congregating in villages, we have spread infections amongst each other from animals to humans and humans to humans. And that human contact drives infection. And why is that important? Well. Only today, the World Health Organization is deciding whether we have a new public health emergency of international concern. It's called monkeypox. A little bit unfair on monkeys because you mostly get it from rats, um, but it looks a bit like uh, chickenpox. And there are now already over 3,000 cases in 30 countries around the world. So you could call it a pandemic, but there have been very few deaths. Um, we, we know that it comes from close physical contact. At the very bottom of my slide, you can see either intimate skin to skin or mouth to mouth transmission. It's not so much sexually transmitted, even though it's more common in men who have sex with men. 
And what's critical to ask as a health practitioner of a patient with a rash and a fever and flu-like symptoms, where have they traveled to and have they been exposed to anyone with a, a rash like chickenpox? So the one thing that clinically helps is I'm trying to show here that there's big lymph nodes in the neck and that makes monkeypox different to either smallpox or chickenpox. So having lymph nodes in the neck is a key clinical sign. So coming back to the main topic, and I'm so glad, um, Susie, you've intervened and showed me what to do. Um, I asked Professor Groman what I should talk about, and he wrote to me two days ago that COVID cannot be controlled by one approach alone. We still need approaches for people at high risk with masks and social distancing. We still need all of us to observe hygiene, and we need those vaccines, especially, and vaccines are useless unless they're actually put into arms. And that's what I mean by vaccination. And it's an issue that's global, even more than local. We need boosters and we need new vaccines being developed. And by the end of my talk, I will have discussed a few of them. But we also need treatments. We cannot just with vaccines alone get herd immunity. That's been proven more and more in recent months. And we know that we can uh, stop severe infection and severe disease, but we can't stop infection. And so antivirals are part of the approach and they are specifically against the virus or they could just be anti-inflammatory. And then there are monoclonal antibodies. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them too. There are ways in which we can rapidly provide protection uh, rather than waiting for natural immunity to develop, which takes 10 to 14 days. So if we're going to do all these measures, um, I, I want to challenge you to say um, uh, we have to do them in a sensible way. So, you know, we're wearing masks and I've just got off a plane this afternoon where I was wearing a mask on the plane, but not in the airport, because the considered view right now is that in airports, we don't pass infection on nearly so much as in the confined spaces of an airline um, uh, a plane. So for people, uh, uh, the new outdoor seat belt is now available if you wanted to have belt and braces, uh, um, but let's, let's be sensible in what we do. Um, one of the Australian groups uh, uh, who are sage-like um, wisdom uh, have said that uh, at the end of last year, we would get 30 to 80 deaths in children uh, when we released the uh, restrictions on social distancing and on using masks. We got about three. So we have to go to a lot of different experts to get adequate expertise. And that's what I've tried to do in this talk. I've done hours and weeks of research to try and get the best information for you. So if we're going to give antiviral medications to prevent severe COVID, they have to be given early, within five days of symptom onset, while the virus is still multiplying in the body. So that's really important. And you need a script from the GP to do that. And if we look at the second paragraph, an awareness campaign has been promoted just in the last month that people who are sitting at home and they're, they've got a positive rapid test, they can do something if they're at risk. If they have an immunosuppression or a chronic medical problem, they can see a GP. And as the president of the RICGP, the College of GPs, Karen Price has said, um, people need to know that they can see a GP early for medication that works. And as Alan Cheng has said, we don't have many levers left to protect those at severe risk if the vaccines aren't working, but they are working. But the small percentage of people with immunosuppression, we need antivirals as well. So we need um, complex approaches. We just don't have simplistic antivirals vaccines. We need to do the whole gamut of interventions. And an international collaboration is applying innovative uh, research and testing methods and uh, innovation to actually how they fund it as well to get results cheaper and faster. If we look at the second paragraph, we're looking at all sorts of drugs. And one of them is uh, an antidepressant um, called fluvoxamine. And it was reported last year in an RCT from Brazil that you could reduce uh, hospitalization by a third and a meta-analysis this year, perhaps by a quarter. So even clinical trials need to be properly evaluated. And much as this provided hope, so many trials of so many possible medications 
have failed. And you have to look at the very, very best evidence to understand whether a drug is worth taking or not. And we've had a lot of discussion and a lot of controversy about drugs like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. And essentially the best quality studies have not shown that they prevent hospitalization. They may be helpful in some small way, but the best quality studies have not shown benefit. So going back to that flu, fluvoxamine, it even looked, you know, in a randomized controlled trial and other two trials, it looked really good, but it is not FDA approved. It is not American approved, WHO approved or Australian approved. And it's not in the COVID-19 treatment guidelines because the best quality evidence doesn't support it being effective. So that's one of the dilemmas we have. We have to really uh, look at the quality of the data to find out what really works and what doesn't work so well. So I won't go into the detail, details, details. The results, when they are looked at very carefully, are not convincing. And you can look at these slides later for the details. Only last week, um, I was delighted to see that the famous musician Dolly Parton, who many of us love for 50 years or more, has given yet another million dollars in the last week to research on, on, on vaccines against COVID. And I just wanted to mention that as a bit of light relief, but really to show respect to people who put their money where their mouth is to support high quality research for the treatment and the prevention of COVID. Now, what are we dealing with right now? Omicron. And this slide essentially says that when we started out with the Wuhan strain, the original Chinese strain, the likelihood of one person infecting others was one would infect two people on, on average. And then it doubled with alpha and delta and it got to five. And that's the basic reproduction number. And then it got to over 10 with Omicron. And even within Omicron, it's gotten worse and worse. Do you realize that Omicron has 50 mutations compared with the original Chinese strain? And there are 32 alone in the spike protein that sticks out from the virus and 15 in the area of receptor binding domain, which is where it binds to the human cells. So the variants just keep coming. We've got BA1, BA2, now four and five, et cetera. So the living evidence at the, from the New, New South Wales Department of Health Clinical Intelligence Unit says, that the overall growth advantage for Omicron is about one third more than Delta, which we had last year. And if you're in a household, um, um, my wife has only just been infected two or three weeks ago, the person, the chance of transmission increases uh, the secondary attack rate from about 15% to 30%. So it doubles um, with Omicron um, uh, compared with, uh, it's 50% higher with Omicron compared with Delta, 10 to 20%. So a simple thing there says that you still are less likely to transmit than not transmit. So about still about 70% of the time when you've got a, a household outbreak, the secondary attack rate in say um, a, a partner or a child is less than uh, 50%. So taking clever measures, sensible measures at home when you have someone at home with Omicron can prevent transmission. So um, BA1 uh, was, was the first variant of Omicron, which came in December, January. And then BA2 came rapidly on its heels in January, February, and it was 40% more likely than BA1 um, to produce secondary infections. And if you look at the last point, the estimates of disease severity are lower with Omicron compared to Delta, and that's good news. So some of you uh, are interested in Ford Falcons and BA1 and BA2 actually got together and mutated and produced a new variant called XE. And the Ford Falcon XE back 30 years ago is this is what it looked like. And it was 10% faster and it was 10% more transmissible than uh, BA1, BA2. Uh, so I just use this as an illustration Maybe it's a bit silly, but the recombination of one and two led to the XE Omicron variant. And, and that's now been surpassed by BA4 and BA5. So da Danish data back in uh, February, March this year told us that the 
the very high transmissibility, but the reduced virulence, the reduced nastiness of Omicron uh, combined with a high vaccination and booster rates and the use of antiviral treatments have pushed the case fatality rate for COVID below that for flu. Now that's the uh, interpretation of JP Morgan. Um, and they noted that deaths now in COVID, 40% of the time are people dying with it, not of it. So 60% of people are dying actually of the COVID, but 40% are dying with it and with having another condition. So we may yet, by the end of this year, be living with COVID-19 like we do with flu. But Australian epidemiologists, and my last point there, warn that new variants are likely to mean some public health measures remain necessary. So in an editorial I wrote with uh, Gary Groman, it was in the uh, Medical Journal of Australia just a couple of months ago, we emphasised the great importance of global surveillance of novel uh, infections that come from animals to humans that have pandemic prote uh, potential. And these uh, surveillance mechanisms internationally are providing us with really important information. Uh, so in March, the WHO said, um, uh, uh, in terms of, of COVID, that given its widespread transmission, it's transmitted this variant around the world more than any other variant. Uh, the possibility of continued evolution, change, ongoing change is high, and a new variant may emerge before we have a vaccine that's effective for it. So we do need to be careful. So far, our vaccines, based on the original Wuhan Chinese strain, are still protecting against the new variants. So that's good news. But every six months, we've had a new variant, Alpha, Beta, Delta, Omicron, it's six months. Are we due for a new variant this week, this month, next month? We don't know, but it's something that we need to be doing surveillance for. And, and that's what the editorial in the medical journal emphasized. So this is a complicated slide, but just look at the, the right-hand side of the Omicron variants in orange and red. And that's what we're dealing with at the moment, BA4 and 5 and BA2 12.1. So only two days ago, it was reported uh, that the number of COVID infections in Australia was at least twice what it was reported uh, amongst adults uh, based on blood tests, which are reliable, which show antibody. Queensland is the highest, and perhaps because they've had uh, hot, hot people holidaying there in January, February, um, and being on holiday, there's some uh, disinhibition from alcohol consumption and the fact that they had fewer infections before. So Queensland might be having a higher, highest rate because of the, all those factors. But the, the data shows that by the end of February, at least 3.5 million Australians had caught the virus. And some people, this is important to know, infected with the very earliest version of Omicron, BA1, are vulnerable to some reinfection, usually mild, um, with BA45. So that's something to look out for, uh, but it tends to be secondary infections tend to be milder and vaccination is definitely preventing and protecting against severe disease. So if someone is not vaccinated, if they've got immunosuppression, one of the things you could do is early treatment with monoclonal antibodies. Um, and it has to be done while the virus is still replicating in the body. Now, we all know uh, Donald Trump, and uh, back in October, November, October of um, 2020, more than 18 months ago, he got COVID. And uh, he, there was some concern about his health. Um, and he got treated with a monoclonal called Ronaprev. Um, and he also got treated with steroids and, and oxygen. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that came out was that um, the, the monoclonal antibody treatment was probably very effective and it gave him a big favor. Um, but the steroids he may not have needed because he wasn't really severe enough to need steroids. But what it meant was that he had um, behaviors which were, were a bit hyperbolic, let's say, they're a bit excitable. Um, and you can, with high dose steroids, um, get a, a transient hypomania. And he actually, reported to the media that he was wearing a Superman t-shirt under his white shirt 
and he was going to rip it open and reveal itself to the world. Uh, so he said that a couple of times. So I think um, and it came straight from the source. So I think the steroids were, were affecting his brain. So um, Rhodopreve, that drug was TGA approved. But once we got Omicron, we got some more resistance. The evolution of the virus affects how antibodies work. And monoclonal antibodies like Rhodopreve proved to be less effective to Omicron BA1. And then there was another one from GSK, an intravenous treatment called Citrovimab that appeared to be still effective. Um, and, uh, but, but, but once we got to BA2, it, it, the, uh, the, the variations and the evolution and the mutation meant that it was less susceptible to the monoclonal. So these are things that are constantly being checked and evaluated. Um, and I, I, was, I was just uh, intrigued by the political going on last year, um, not just with Trump, but uh, in Australia. And uh, Jackie Lambie um, uh, said some fairly sort of straightforward things. And one of them was be a goddamn bloody adult and put others before yourself and get vaccinated. So that was a rather simplistic way of saying things, but it had some, uh, had some value in it, I think. So recently um, I've been to the Archibald Prize as it toured Australia. And the winner last year was um, uh, a painting of a 100-year-old Australian. And it was the 100th anniversary um, of, of the Archibald Prize. And for people who are immunosuppressed and older, uh, there are a series of drugs, monoclonal antibodies, which I mentioned like Citrovibab, but also a monoclonal called Evusheld, which you can give as a um, uh, treatment before you even have COVID. So it's not a vaccine, um, but it acts to protect you bef before you're even exposed. And there are two antivirals, one called uh, Molnupiravir and one called Paxlovid, both of which the TGA have approved and you can get on GP uh, prescription. And I, I, I like to uh, illustrate Molnupiravir means Thor's hammer. So that's the Norse god of thunder. And he had a big hammer uh, as in the movies. And so that hammer, that drug, that antiviral uh, is used to smash the virus. Uh, and it's about 30% effective. Whereas Paxlovid, which is another uh, viral uh, treatment, um, and I, I like to call it peace and love, Pax being the Latin word for peace, peace and love, it, it's more like 80 to 90% effective. Uh, it just has a lot of drug interactions. So it's really important that the GP checks what drugs a patient is already on as to whether they can have Paxlovid. And if they're on drugs that they must keep going, then Paxlovid may not work and they have to use Molnupiravir or, the, or um, but potentially an intravenous infusion of monoclonal antibody like Citrovimab as treatment. So if you're looking at pre-exposure, so prevention before you've even been exposed to the virus, there is a, a, a drug from AstraZeneca called Evusheld. It's uh, made up of two monoclonals that are listed on the slide. Um, and Perhaps 2% of Australians, half a million people, uh, are, are in the category of having immunosuppression and could benefit uh, from the use of Evusheld pre-exposure. And it's important to recognise that the second bottom line, 40% of COVID hospitalisations are, are immunocompromised. So um, maybe only 2% of the population, but they make up nearly half of people hospitalised with breakthrough uh, COVID uh, disease. So this Evusheld I've said already um, is, is effective. Uh, the studies suggest, and you don't have to go into the detail, but in a study only completed this month, uh, the suggestion is that there's almost 80% reduction uh, in severity in hospitalization with that drug. Um, so uh, a, a paper just published in the, the journal Science in the UK tells us that Omicron 1 has been replaced by Omicron 2. And it's so transmissible that the prevalence by March, uh, just three months ago, was the highest ever recorded in the UK. Um, and I note also the paper says that the greatest increase were in those aged over 65, with more hospitalizations and deaths. And actually, Australia has seen nearly 7,000 deaths this year compared with only 2,200 
in the two previous years. So in less than six months, we've had over 6,000 deaths compared with only 2,200 in the previous two years. It's also, uh, Omicron has also affected unvaccinated children under five. So I, I wanted to talk about where did Omicron come from for just two minutes. Um, there's been a lot of controversy for the last year. Did it come from a lab in China? Was it released on purpose or by mistake? Uh, well, uh, let me give you a bit of history. Way back in 2005, uh, 17 years ago, uh, they did a genomic sequence of human coronaviruses and they looked at the molecular clock. They looked at the mutation from the, the form that affected cattle and when got into humans. And the molecular clock um, of a bovine, a bee COVID and a human COVID, um, suggested a zoonotic transmission that is from human to, from animals to human occurred in 1890. So what happened in 1890? Well, there was a Russian flu pandemic around the world. So Omicron, not Omicron, so coronavirus may well have been the cause of an international pandemic way back in 1890. That's still speculative, but it's being strongly debated. In 2019, uh, Australian experts like Professor Eddie Holmes and Professor Dominic Dwyer both uh, concluded, uh, and again in 2021, that the current COVID-19 probably came from animals by mistake and is not of laboratory origin. So I won't go into any more detail other than to say the two best virological experts in New South Wales and Australia have concluded it's an animal uh, zoonotic transmission and uh, not an intentional infection. So a study just published from Laos in Asia shows that uh, when they looked at the bat populations and they looked at 650 odd, uh, they found three coronaviruses in the bats that were very genetically similar to SARS. And so that is consistent with that the viruses have the potential to jump from bats to humans like SARS um, uh, CoV-1 did and CoV-2 may well have done. And the existence of these viruses um, supports the theory that it came from, from bats. So up until 20 years ago, um, we didn't pay much attention to coronaviruses. And then SARS, SARS-1 came along um, and caused uh, 8,000 uh, cases and 800 deaths. And it was a, a, a pandemic. Um, but we've always known in humans that coronavirus, uh, sorry, we've all, always known in animals that coronavirus is important. So beginning about um, 1967, we started to discover coronaviruses in humans. And the first one was um, uh, human coronavirus OC43. And the reason I mention that again is that's the one uh, which is believed to have perhaps caused the 1890 Russian flu pandemic. So the viruses are coming and they're mutating. So I've said this slide already, um, the COVID variants in uh, 2022 in Australia have killed an extra six to 7,000 people. It's really interesting to compare across countries. How well has Australia done compared to other countries? Well, it's really very similar to other island nations uh, like New Zealand and Singapore and Taiwan. New Zealand and Singapore each have about 5 million people, as does Queensland. And all of them, Queensland, New Zealand and Singapore, have had about 1,200, 1,400 deaths. So we're all quite similar. Taiwan which has a population similar to Australia of about 26 million, has had 5,000 deaths, which is similar to our 9,000. They're in the same order of magnitude. But really interesting, if you look at an issue called excess mortality, that is where you determine the, the number of deaths overall and whether it's greater than the historical average. And Australia really stands out. If you look right to the bottom of my slide, you see that Australia doesn't have excess mortality as of the beginning of this year. So per head of population, Australia has actually had about a 10 times lower rate of COVID fatality compared with either the UK or the USA. Um, so we've had a handful of deaths in children. 
um, and I won't go into those details. But deaths did jump by more than 20% above the historical average in Australia in the first couple of months of this year. And in bold, the biggest surge um, has occurred in excess deaths only this year. And if we look at the final paragraph, paragraph in bold, in past years, excess mortality typically occurred during winter when we had flu and uh, influenza causing deaths from pneumonia and heart, heart attacks. But the sustained excess mortality in January, February this year uh, aligns with the COVID waves that are now impacting Australia as it has around the world. But it's not children. Um, the risk in children is very low. If you compare adults aged 18 to 29, this is US data, the death rate in people 30 to 39 who are healthy is four times higher. And in people 50 to 64, which includes me, the death rate from COVID is 25 times higher than it was in uh, younger adults aged 18 to 29. So that gives you a very clear indication that COVID is going for older people. So um, uh, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides. It's a complex decision whether to vaccinate children. And I'm generally in favor of vaccinating children at risk who have a chronic medical problem and children uh, who uh, are going to daycare or primary school uh, because they can uh, be directly pr protected and prevented from passing it to other family members. But the recent data uh, it's just been released and decided upon, again, only last week in the US, um, looking at the Pfizer vaccine, they decided in under fives that it was less immunogenic and you needed to give three doses. Um, it, when we look at uh, what they said in, in the UK, children of primary school age were made eligible uh, by their uh, joint committee in February, but they made it a non-urgent thing. So they didn't make it something that you must do uh, rapidly. And so people at high risk are getting vaccinated, but not all children are racing to be vaccinated in the UK. So there's some controversy about this, and I wish I had more time to discuss. Um, real world evidence is showing that um, the virus is uh, seemingly becoming less severe uh, and causing less in the way of severe complications in children. It used to be that about one in 3,000 children who got COVID would get a severe multi-system inflammatory syndrome with fever and rash, et cetera. Uh, but that number is uh, blowing out now. Um, now this is just published this week um, and it just emphasizes uh, a, a point that should be made that the vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization in children uh, remains high and the uh, use of booster doses in, uh, in adults uh, has been conferring additional protection as, as well as in uh, teenagers too. Um, also just released is that Moderna have uh, announced the preliminary results of its bivalent, its two-fold vaccine, and it's showing stronger immune uh, reaction, a higher neutralizing antibody um, against all the variants. So it may be that the vaccine we've been using now for a couple of years will be updated soon the way we do with a flu vaccine. Um, and it'll be updated with um, uh, examples from Moderna and other companies which cover the Omicron variant. Um, I don't really have time to talk about uh, uh, vaccine safety monitoring other than to say Australia has done a fantastic job um, and we've shown in children that vaccine is better tolerated than it is in, in adults. So children of primary school age tolerate uh, COVID vaccine better than adults. Um, the one complication and side effect that we've worried about is uh, myocarditis. And we found that it's most common in older teenagers, especially boys, and especially after the second dose. So if you look at this slide and you look at the age uh, at 16, 18, you can see uh, the second dose is much more likely to cause the complication of myocarditis, and uh, it's also more common in boys. And if it's going to occur, it usually occurs within two or three days. 
So the take home message is that um, uh, although myocarditis uh, can occur after vaccination uh, with an mRNA vaccine, the great majority of cases are mild and get better and they can be treated with non-steroidals. So uh, a few comments about vaccine hesitancy before I finish. Um, I think it's really important to listen to people who are concerned about vaccines, to have a meaningful discussion with them. And in fact, I think um, a, a compassionate approach with consultation and a lot of listening before you do any talking is really important. I do believe that uh, we need to distinguish our rights from our responsibilities. And for a transmissible disease, I do think it's a good idea for there to be high vaccination rates to prevent transmission in the community. And that's something that uh, the use of decision aids can be helpful, um, such as available on the net for children. And also for adults, there's one at the bottom of this page called Coracle. And decision aids can be very useful to you to uh, use when you're consulting uh, with patients who are uncertain that they want to be vaccinated against COVID um, themselves or for their children. I just um, photographed this today. Um, this is um, uh, literature from anti-vaccine people who claim that you're 50 times more likely to die from the vaccine than the virus. Um, and this is the kind of misinformation we're up against. Uh, we need to uh, examine the information that, uh, and the data and the evidence as closely and as carefully as possible. Um, and various people have approached me and I've engaged with them. Uh, people like a, a man with a PhD in engineering said, I did a thousand hours of research and I did it back to back for 18 hours. Well, um, I would respond that epidemiology and public health, the science of public health, it really needs a minimum of 10,000 hours before you've got a, a handle on it. But um, I think I've done 50,000 in the last 40 years. Um, uh, so I, I, I think the approach to, um, to people who are concerned about the safety is to, is to be compassionate and to listen. Um, and uh, I, I do think if you take what I call a narrative approach, that's examples, uh, it can help people to understand better. If you just throw information at them, they're uh, less likely to, to want to believe you, but information plus a compassionate and a narrative approach, I think is appropriate. Now, I've just uh, been celebrating my wife's 60th birthday and mine was a few months ago. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to call myself Astra Boy because I had two doses of AstraZeneca, um, and uh, I also had a booster. And I did get mild Omicron uh, earlier this year. I actually caught it on a plane coming from Brisbane too. But I only had symptoms for three days and uh, I quickly recovered. And the evidence coming out now without showing you all the papers is that the best immunity is called hybrid. It's a combination of being vaccinated and having had a mild COVID infection. It provides very strong protection against uh, Omicron infection. Um, I'm excited to uh, show you this, that uh, there are plenty of superheroes out there. Everyone can be a superhero and vaccinate uh, themselves and their children. Um, and very excitingly, the Immunisation Foundation of Australia, the, the founder of that, um, Catherine Hughes, has just been honoured in the Queensland, uh, the Queen's birthday honours, um, which is absolutely lovely and her own uh, child died of whooping cough. And so of course she's keen to promote vaccination more generally of, of children. Uh, Gary Groman and I have written um, uh, a dozen editorials only in the, um, uh, the Daily Telegraph and other Australian newspapers. Uh, and we uh, are of the view that uh, vaccination globally is really important and it's not about just getting Australians vaccinated, but it's supporting the national and international campaigns. Uh, and as my final slide, and I think I've made it to 40 minutes, um, uh, this is some late breakers. Um, flu and COVID are starting to behave more and more alike. They're both RNA viruses, they both mutate, they both change, and we can, it can prevent both of them with vaccines, but we might well have to update them every year. Um, 
uh, atagi has been saying for six months now that you can give uh, the vaccines available for them at the same time, but in separate arms. But uh, there's uh, a vaccination uh, underway, under development, results coming soon of a combined flu and COVID vaccine from Novavax, um, which looks very promising. Um, and uh, more importantly, um, the TGA have uh, the uh, the TGA, yes, have approved uh, the use of Novavax for boosting. Now, a lot of people um, um, wanted to wait for a protein vaccine to get their original primary vaccination or their boosting uh, against COVID. And that's now available for boosting of people who've had no vaccination uh, for primary immunization or for boosting. And uh, announced only this week, Moderna have a three in one combo showing promising results. Uh, with a vaccine containing um, vaccines against flu, COVID, and RSV. <laughs> Sorry for racing through that, but I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, that was an excellent presentation as usual. Um, there is a question uh, in the Q&A uh, from Robin Horry. Um, with, people, uh, with people in the over 65 age group who have had three Pfizer vaccines, should their fourth booster dose be again a Pfizer vaccine or would a different type be a better choice? Well, that's a really good question. Um, the, the simple answer is that um, either mRNA or a um, protein-based vaccine um, would give uh, from the evidence um, from the UK especially would give good boosting. So I, 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 I won't be prescriptive I think uh, a fourth mRNA or a protein-based vaccine like Novavax um, would be safe and effective and, and worth having, uh, especially if you're a minimum of four to six months since your third dose. There's a lot of people out there now who would benefit from a fourth dose, uh, people who are 65 and older, but also people with chronic medical conditions. And it's a real pity um, that... Um, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's a truth that vaccination immunity wanes after four to six months. So boosters are indicated, they're free, and they're worth having. Just to tease that out a little bit more, the, there is evidence that's also come through, uh, through that heterologous boosting is uh, preferable. Um, would you agree or? or... Yeah, well, the, the, the study from, from Oxford, um, especially, but also from Germany, showed that heterologous um, meaning you've had started with one vaccine, then you moved on to boost with a different one. It does provide benefit, yes. And I think it, it's probably in the main better to have one than the other. I had AstraZeneca for first two, and then I had Pfizer. I was very happy to have a Pfizer booster. The heterologous boost was shown in those studies uh, to be very good and, and more protective. I agree with you, Gary. Just to encourage everyone, if they have a question, to type it into the Q&A, not the chat. Uh, so if you have a question, please do so. While, while you're doing that, I just wanted to ask you, Robert, about uh, your great comment about quality of data rather than looking at just data. Um, we understand that as scientists, uh, but how can we get the message out? Because there's so much disinformation, misinformation, but also very educated people, as you pointed out, whether they're engineers or medical practitioners or scientists who just take data and don't look at the quality of the data and then make comment. And in the age of Twitter, in the age of social media and so on, um, there's been a lot of confusion in the last two years. So I do wonder how we can get the message out. Well, that's um, a brilliant question with a, with a, a muted answer. I, I've said already that it's really important to listen to people. It's really important, however, to evaluate the evidence at the, at the highest level, um, evidence based on very good quality studies. And I tried to illustrate that even an RCT of an antidepressant, which looked very promising, once it was looked at very closely, it was not uh, shown to be effective enough to be recommended. And then there are all those drugs that we thought two years ago, like hydroxychloroquine and, and so on, uh, which have also been put to the test in randomized controlled trials, high quality research, and not 
shown to be effective. I've got very close relatives in my own family who uh, don't see eye to eye uh, with me. And we have agreed to disagree. So we're still um, close relatives and, and close friends, but we agree not to discuss the topic. Um, and some people are absolutely convinced uh, anti-vaccine and there's no debate worth having. And that occurs in perhaps 2% of the population. Mm. But there's maybe 20% who are just vaccine hesitant. They're concerned, they need evidence, they need reassurance, they need data, they need discussion, they need to be listened to. And for those people, you can make a real difference. Yes. And, yes. and, and for them, we can get them vaccinated and protect them. Yes. yes. No, thank you. So we have another question from Lisa Cantors. Given the rising numbers of infection, uh, despite vaccines, I presume in brackets, why are we not seeing more emphasis on keeping our masks on? How do you feel about yeah. that? Yeah. Look, that's a really good question as well. And um, personally, uh, I'm still strongly recommending the use of masks for at-risk people. So you use a mask for, for two possible reasons, uh, to stop yourself catching the infection or to stop yourself from transmitting it. Um, and people who are vulnerable, uh, who have a chronic medical condition, they have immunosuppression, they're el maybe very elderly, they still will benefit greatly from social distancing, mask use, um, and all the other um, hand washing and hygiene and so on. I think um, we're trying to emphasize that uh, as I as I tried to pose a question to you, which you answered in, in my opening slides. It's not one thing or the other, it's a, it's a series of things that we can still do. And depending on your risk status, if you're one of those at-risk people with chronic medical condition, with uh, immunosuppression, you should mm -hmm. avail yourself of masks and minimize, you, you can't live like a monk, but minimize your contact to big crowds. So I wouldn't recommend uh, you flying over to Perth to the state of origin uh, this weekend. Um, uh, and um, and I, I, I wouldn't recommend um, close contact, uh, hugging and kissing relatives who have symptoms of respiratory disease. So there are things that people can still do and there are vaccinations that can still be boosted, which will provide um, better protection. No, thank you. <laughs> I have a question long on the, just to get back to the fourth dose vaccination discussion. Um, thoughts on the fourth dose vaccination for healthy frontline workers, emergency services who have not had COVID vaccination for six to seven months. What would be your recommendation there? Um, well, well, the first thing to say is that um, the evidence uh, is that after four to six months, the level of immunity is declining. Um, and especially against Omicron, which is the variant we're up against right now, and the various sub-variants, BA4, 5, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, I would say that we've got supply. Thirdly, it's free. Um, and uh, are you get, uh, you, you know, so healthcare workers, fourthly, are being exposed to COVID. Of course they are, because that's what, you know, people with, Respiratory symptoms come to hospital, they go to GPs, they see nurses. So uh, for all those reasons and more, it's wise to get yourself protected. And um, uh, uh, people under 65 who are, um, have a, any kind of chronic medical problem can get the fourth dose. Um, people with severe immunosuppression can get a fifth dose so they can keep going to maintain their protection. Um, I, I uh, have to remind myself what the TGA is saying, but personally, uh, I think they should be saying if they haven't already said that uh, healthcare workers are right in the front line and they really should be getting, whether they're nurses, doctors, physios, whatever, they should be getting their uh, fourth dose. Um, I'm 60, I want my fourth dose as soon as I can get one. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm healthy, uh, but um, you know I'm uh, I'm now six months out from my third dose, and so I'm 
I'm keen to get my four clothes as soon as my GP will give me one. Yeah, just to, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, the um, uh, TGA wouldn't recommend that. I mean, it, it'll be a target or the Department of Health. That... Oh, sorry. Yes, no, good good point. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 it's not I, just I, the role I agree. Of TGA. Yeah, it's just not the role of TGA. Yeah. Right, uh, a question or comment from Rachel Stevens. Uh, there was a talk on ABC about sticky variant being dominant in Sydney. Does this affect the general public's uptake of vaccines when these discussions hit the media? You might have to explain the sticky variant. I'm not familiar. <laughs> sticky so. variant. It's a bit of research that's come out of um, the team at the Kirby Institute, University of New South Wales. And essentially, they're saying that um, uh, BA4 going through to BA5, um, the virus itself um, is better able to bind, to stick to the human cell in the nose and throat. So that stickiness enables it to trend, uh, to get into the nose and then get into the, the cell and cause, uh, an, uh, an, um, cause an infection, which could be symptomatic and could be severely symptomatic. So mm -hmm. it's more transmissible. So sticky simply means what we've been saying all along. With each variant, it gets more and yet more transmissible, more likely to spread. And, 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 it, and it does that by being better able to bind to a human cell and then invade that human cell. Uh, so that's where the stickiness comes in. Okay. And it's a bit of a complicated thing for the general public, but I think that explains it fairly simply. And it's a motivation for saying, you know, we need protection and it's available. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, question from Jane. Curry, I think it is. Are people who have are people who have had COVID more at risk of getting flu in the same year? I have heard a few times uh, of a few teens who have had both COVID and the flu within approximately a few months. Well, that's a that's a lovely question, and you know what I think is this. Um, I personally uh, feel. Uh, uh, much more protected because I've got that hybrid immunity. I've been both vaccinated and I've had a mild infection. So what happens behaviorally in humans is that if you have a perception that your vulnerability is less, that you're less likely to catch COVID, you might expose yourself more readily to crowded situations. And in crowded situations, viruses, whether it's flu or adenovirus or COVID or paraflu or RSV or rhino, any virus, likes you to be up close and personal with fellow humans, that whole crowding concept that I opened the lecture with. And, and therefore, you may hear of reports where people can get flu a couple of months after COVID simply because they think, oh, the, well, I'm okay now, I've had COVID and I've been vaccinated, whereas they've forgotten that uh, you know, close human contact can spread any old respiratory virus. Yeah. yeah. Fun. Well, that's one explanation. There's probably others. There's coincidence. Um, and there are some people uh, who are genetically more predisposed to having viral infection. And, uh, and that can come down to some fairly rare genetic problems. So a question from Fran Acid. Will a second influenza vaccination be an option again this year, given the increase in hospitalisation and infection rates of both viruses? So yeah, that's that's uh, an interesting question. I think um, second influenza vaccines should be reserved for people at high risk, uh, people with a chronic lung problem, immunosuppression, uh, over seventy-five, those kind of really high risk uh, situations. What we know from flu vaccination is that it's effective, um, but it works for three to six months. So three months into the flu season, if flu is still transmitting at a high level, some people who are vaccinated may be losing their protection, especially if uh, they are immunosuppressed for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So um, I I'm very much in favour of research to look at giving a second flu uh, vaccine as a booster for at-risk people. And I think we need to do the research to understand whether it's needed and whether it's immunogenic, whether it's safe, all those things need to be done 
some people uh, in general practice, uh, a minority are routinely double vaccinating people three months apart. I don't think we've got the evidence for that yet, but I do think it's an important question that should be addressed by research. Look, we asked yes. quite a few questions and only five minutes left, but um, I'll get through as many as I can. From James Williams, with so many rat tests instead of PCR tests being used for diagnosis, how does this affect our ability to effectively determine which strain is dominant in the Australian population? Thanks for that question too. Um, the rat, the rapid antigen test um, is less reliable, it's less sensitive, less sensitive means that it sometimes miss, misses a positive diagnosis. And of course, you don't get the, the sequence of the virus from it, which you can get from uh, applying a, a PCR test to uh, genetic um, sequencing. So the question uh, relates to whether we can get a, keep a good handle. We've still got a lot of PCR, and that's being done in hospitals on severe cases. So we've got a lot of data, and we're sharing it with our colleagues um, in Germany and else uh, in, in Melbourne and elsewhere. Um, and, and so I don't think there's a problem. I, I would point out that one of my slides noted that the research by the Kirby Institute and the National Centre released only this week shows that there's twice as much infection out there as that we've been proving. Uh, I also would note that some people who are symptomatic are hiding it because they don't want to have to isolate. And that's a pity because they then spread it in the work, workplace or in the schools. Uh, so that's a bit of a shame. Um, uh, so I'll leave it at that. No. Question for you. There seems to be reports of a 20% risk of long COVID with infection and reinfection or all reinfection. Can you comment on the value of vaccination for protection against the concerning cardiovascular and neurovascular symptoms that are being reported? Well, yeah, long COVID, the, 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 the commonest um, uh, number quoted is 20%. Mm. Uh, as a, uh, it's much more likely if you've had severe COVID than if you've had a mild infection. If you've been vaccinated and you get a mild COVID, the chance of long COVID is halved, less than 10%. There's several studies showing that. Um, there are... Um, the people who get long COVID tend to have been hospitalized, especially intensive care. They've had a high viral load. They've been knocked around by the virus and by hospitalization as well. Yeah. Um, the complications in the heart and, um, and the brain and elsewhere um, are really important. And we need to do a lot more research. I've got several slides on this, but there wasn't time. Uh, let's do another talk and we'll, we'll deal with long COVID. Um, there's some really interesting recent research um, suggesting that there may just be some new treatments that might work, but it's not definitive or, or convincing yet. Uh, so long COVID is a real concern. Uh, it's more likely if you've, if you've had severe COVID in the first place and vaccination at least halves uh, the risk. And the last question, uh, so we can finish on time, Robert, uh, from uh, Jane Curry again. Uh, what are the recommendations for people who have had three doses and have had COVID twice, when is the fourth dose recommended after the second COVID infection? <laughs> <Is it? laughs> well, if they were proven infections, that's really bad luck. Uh, it is described and it can happen, um, but the great majority of people who get um, a breakthrough infection and, a, and a, especially a second breakthrough will have it quite mildly. And, and when there are second breakthroughs, they're much more likely to be less severe. They, there are occasional descriptions in the literature, case reports of people getting it more severely the second time. So we're dealing with a virus that uh, has mutated incredibly quickly and has been uh, very hard to keep up with, but we have kept up with it pretty well. The first time in history, first time in human history, we've kept up with a pandemic virus with our preventative measures. So we don't have all the answers. There are people who are getting these breakthroughs and second breakthroughs. We need to keep studying it and we need to keep uh, collecting information. When you get that uh, next booster, uh, uh, with, it's sort of an evidence-free area, but the best I would say is that uh, unless you've got an immuno, 
um, deficiency. And perhaps the, the GP and the uh, specialist immunologist or infectious disease doctor should be consulted because if you're having two breakthroughs after triple vaccination, there may be something wrong with your immunity that needs to be investigated. Uh, okay. so okay. We've finished okay. on time. So thank you for that, Robert. Uh, we've finished all the questions as well, uh, which is terrific. So it just remains for me to thank you personally for all the work that you've put in and for the great presentation that you've given everyone. I understand the slides will be available. I think I'm correct in that, yes. So I just wanted to thank you again and also thank Susie behind the scenes for the IT support and for all the organization and so on, which is also so critical so that these seminars can run so smoothly. So on behalf of everybody, Robert, thank you again very, very much. Thanks thank Gary you. and thanks Susie, cheers. Yeah, and good night, everyone.